Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Monmouth at the Warren County History Museum, which has undergone enormous changes in the last several years. Once located in the Roseville High School, it moved to Monmouth six years ago when this enormous facility, a church and school building, became available. And it really gave it a chance to spread its wings. Marvin Hawk, one of the main rooms in here is dedicated to the town of Roseville and the history of Roseville. You got really involved in studying Roseville. You also happened to be a woodworker. So it worked into both of your addictions, didn't yes. it? History yes, and it woodworking. <laughs> and so what we have right in front of us here is a, a beautiful handmade diorama of the, of the city of Roseville. How nice is that, huh? Yeah. To know that people come in here and look at this and pour over it and learn from it. Being a lifelong resident, why, you know, memories mm. came back. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very many museums can say, yeah, we have a diorama, and it was all handmade by a local guy. This is terrific. What a woodworker you are. Um, Roseville was pretty big at one time. Yes, it was. It started out as a very small hamlet, and a population of four to five hundred people mm -hmm. before the railroad came through and then it was really a boom. Uh, the land was being, the agricultural land was being claimed by veterans of 1812 war mm -hmm. and a lot of those people lived out east so they sold their claims to anybody that would pay it so mm -hmm. there was a migration to Roseville. Uh, the town was set out, set up with this crossroads Okay, and the crossroads is here that you're talking about, right? Yes, okay. it was the trail north-south was a trail from Springfield up to Rock Island, Illinois, stagecoach line. A stagecoach line, be Before okay. the railroads came. Mm -hmm. And then the east-west was the stagecoach line from Peoria to Oquawka, All Illinois. Right. That, Oquawka being on the river was the mm -hmm. trading center at that time. And so this was just a natural place. Mm -hmm. At the time of the Roseville settlement, this was the only town between Monmouth and Macomb. Mm -hmm. So it all developed here. We had the gazebo right in the town square where the bands would play uh, once a week. I or assume whatever. that's no longer there. It's right? no longer that's there. Too bad. That's yeah, it too is. Bad. It's too bad it couldn't have been preserved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this block is pretty much still in existence in Roseville, mm -hmm. and. When the railroad came to town, there was other small communities around close moved in and moved their businesses. These prosperous people bought this whole block of land and they called it mm -hmm. the syndicate block so that the people from those other communities could move the lesser buildings in mm -hmm. and not clutter up mm -hmm. North Main. So there's some notable buildings here. That really, now some of these I notice have tin roofs and others don't. I guess the more the more permanent and the more expensive buildings were built with tin roofs. I don't know if I'm yeah. correct on that, yeah. but City Hall is here. The Opera House is here and, and the big hotel is here. But here's an interesting point. This water tower was probably a, a later development? In the 1890s, they developed mm -hmm. that. It was, uh, pumps were driven by steam power. And then the electricity came in the 1890s and uh, the electricity was driven by steam power. Mm -hmm. the, we had the telephones coming to town and the exchange was in the second floor of this building. Mm -hmm. The opera house, originally this two-story unit was the old school. And when they built a new one, they added this on and turned it into an opera house. I see. Okay. That was there until about 1910, and this all burnt. Oh, that's a shame. But uh, the, the high school in the 1890s through about 1902 was held in the second floor of this the bank, bank building. building. I'll be then uh, about 1902, they constructed a brand new brick high school down on mm -hmm. the East Penn. Let's let's go that way because because that's toward the the railroad and where the railroad would have come through town. Yes. And this is this is this is later now. This would be what 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 period are we talking about uh, here? This would be about the same time frame, okay. 1900. Mm -hmm. And this is East Penn. The high school would have been built right in this area here. Mm -hmm. And then we had. Uh, excuse me, this would be East Penn here. Then we had the lumber yards, mm -hmm. uh, the elevators. There was two different elevator systems, mm -hmm. the depot. 
we had a stockyards to load the cattle and hogs and send them to Chicago. And, and again, you built all this. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Congregational church and cemetery. And um, a bab our very first Baptist church uh -huh. was located here. <laughs> they have since, they located uptown. Mm -hmm. This church, later years, was moved about in this area right up here mm -hmm. and used as a woman's club. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, we had a brick factory uh, at the north edge of uh -huh. town and they built all, or they made all the bricks that uh, the uptown buildings, the schools were constructed out of the mm -hmm. bricks from, from this factory. We also, on the plat book, we had a coal mine in this area. There was quite a few coal mines in the Roseville area. They were just a shallow kind of one or two mo a man operation. Uh, the pond is still there. It's used as a sanitary district now, but in early years mm -hmm. it was built mainly for ice and they would, of course, I see. Okay. Cut, cut the that ice, ice out blocks of there in the winter, in the ice house. cover okay. sawdust, mm -hmm. and it would last all summer. Let, let's, let's just go this way because we looked at some of the grain elevators and and this one, this is this farmer grain company elevator is still there. And, and of course, you built this too, didn't you? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, the elevator was built in 1938. Mm -hmm. We have a, a news release on that somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, right along the railroad track, of course. And at that point, when that was built, uh, a group of farmers had gone together and bought the elevator as mm -hmm. an association. Uh, originally they would have pulled their wagons in there, but as you say, I mean, now yeah. they pull their trucks in there and it's big enough to accommodate modern use, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's terrific. They they don't use the semi. Semis will dump elsewhere, but mm -hmm. still trucks can drive yeah. in and uh, uh, use it. Yeah. We, I kept a collection of the different types or different years of <laughs> pens and pencils put out by the farmer's green elevator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here is a, a measuring stick in the old days and you would look up the brand of the wagon, whether it be a McCormick wagon, a John Deere wagon, or an Anthony, mm -hmm. you would stick that in the grain and wherever the grain came up to, it would tell you how many bushels of grain I'll be darned. was they in knew the, the wagon. dimensions. This was geared to the dimensions of the wagon. Yeah, they were, all the wagons were standard isn't that something? Uh, measurements. How ingenious. Well, listen, Marvin, thank you. I, I know you've got some woodworking to do, so I'm going to cut you loose. <laughs> okay. Thanks for showing us thank this. You. This is wonderful. <laughs> Diane Hawk, you and your husband Marvin still live near Roseville. Yes. And you have, uh, in, in this museum, you have a section which is sort of like a general store. Yes. And this isn't your whole collection. Much of your collection is still at your house, right? Right. But you, right. you're willing to share some of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that sign that we were looking at. Yes. Cheaper to buy good soap than new clothes. Right. And that's why you bought that antique soapbox. Isn't right. it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Yes, I like that saying. You know, the, the, uh, the marketing schemes and gimmicks that they used then, they, had, they didn't have anything on us, did they? I mean, they, no. they, they, they pretty much were able to sell anything, uh -huh. weren't they? Yes. And things were cheap. I mean, yes. we're talking things you have here are anywhere from, oh, 1900 to 1950s in, in this store. Mm -hmm. Man, things were cheap. Yes. Like, oh, Henry, right next to you is Nicolo Henry Candy right. Bar. Right, right. <laughs> but when I got my first job, in Roseville after I graduated from high school, I made a dollar an hour mm -hmm. and thought that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, I remember days pretty close to that. A buck and a quarter, I think, is where I started on my yeah. first job. <laughs> yeah, so, I know what you mean. Uh, you you mean. wanted things cheap because yeah. your dollar didn't go Absolutely. very far then just mm -hmm. as now. How long have you been collecting stuff like this? Oh my, 30 years, I mm -hmm. suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Enough to fill two big rooms anyway, yes. right? And this, and we're in one of them. Yeah. I, I, I like the things that you like in here because you like, you like the 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 the, the, the uh, marketing uh, sayings that they used to use. And and this um this one quad quadriga cloth is pretty clever because uh, the girl who sews has yeah. better clothes. Everybody yes. knows that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And oh, look at all this precious stuff. Yes. 
And most of this is from comes from locally, Warren County and, and the Roseville area, yes. doesn't it? Yes. This you're attached to because you picked this out for your wedding, didn't you? I did. I did. Uh, Robin's Jewelry Store was uh, in a small section of the B&K clothing store in Roseville. Mm -hmm. And the glass cost a dollar at the time. <laughs> and I know my teaspoon was a dollar. I don't know about the other pieces. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but when you say it was in B and K, we've got a picture of that over here. That this was yes, a, a clothing that's a store lot earlier than. Uh huh. Now it's not there anymore. When I picked out. But but every town had a like a, a top notch men's clothing right. store, and that was that one in Roseville. Huh? Yes. And yes. and this hat is also important to you because see, there it is, B and K clothing. Yes. But your husband bought that. What was the occasion? Yes. <laughs> well, that was uh, so he would have a hat and nice coat. To leave the church in when we got married. Oh, that was your his wedding hat. His wedding ah, hat. Ah, yes. okay. Well, every dapper man had to have a good hat, right? <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Yes. So this is this is your general store room, and when people come to the Warren County Historical uh, Museum, mm -hmm. they would walk in here and get a little, a little glimpse of the past, wouldn't yes. they? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I enjoyed doing it. <clears throat> it took quite a few trips to Monmouth too. Mm -hmm. Get everything here. Mm -hmm. There's probably over 900 items from. Wow, the and, that, and that's in your collection. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, nice of you to share. Thank you. <laughs> Mark Parrish, when you when you walk into the ag room at the museum, uh, you're reminded that the way it was in past years before there was mechanicals. Yep. And you also will notice that a lot of the tools and 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 the items that you see in those pictures, those farm aids. Are right here in this room. Yes, that's correct. And uh, and that's kind of a neat thing to do because especially when you bring kids in here, they look at those pictures and they can't. They say, "Oh, those are just old pictures." Yeah. But then when they actually see the the farm implements, it it, it makes it a difference. Brings doesn't it? it all together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked you to start me here at the brown corn planter mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. There aren't many of them, correct. and it's a local item, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, Mr. Uh, George Brown, he was. Uh, a resident of Warren County up by the Lexus area uh -huh. and he patented the first uh, horse-drawn corn planter and uh, it was so popular that uh, his manufacturing then moved to the Galesburg area. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times uh, his the planter is uh, cr accredited in Knox County but the manufacturer, the George, the inventor, was mm -hmm. from Warren County. George so Brown, we okay, from Warren County. And this is one of his earlier plant planters. It's mainly made out of wood, and then they eventually became more metal as as mm -hmm. the older things came. Where, where, where you have your hand, this is where the horse would have been. Yeah, this would hitched. have been for uh, purposes of. Uh, this would have been a long time mm -hmm. for the right. horses to hitch yeah, up But to. we can't fit it in here. Right. So, so the horse would be pulling from this. Uh, yeah, and, and just team so of horses can, would be pulling this. Okay, and so, and so people can understand. This is really a two-man operation. Yes, it is. Because you've got a seat here in the front. Yeah, seat here in the front, and the probably the young boy that sat there moved the lever to plant the corn, mm -hmm. and they would mark and mark the corn the, would be in here, yep, in this bin. In both, both bins there. Uh -huh. And... Uh, they would mark the field before planting uh, with the proper spacing, and every time they'd cross that mark, he would drop the seed. Mm -hmm. And the driver for the planter was in the back there, and on that long seat there, he'd slide forward to help bring the planter into the ground, and then when he uh, when he came to the end of the field, he'd slide back. I and this see. is the marker here. It's not here, attached to well, the let's, back. Let's, let's, let's take a look at that. This is the marker here? Yeah, that's the marker. And that's, it would have been in the back. It would have been in the back, and mm -hmm. he'd flip it back and forth, and then he'd make the turn and line up with that mark that it would make. Center the horse. So he that. knows where he's been. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so when he they knows go back, where he's been, and then it would do the spacing for wow. the next, next okay. pass through the field. Okay. So that was actually patented here in Warren County. Yes. And built here for a time. Yes. What about this devil here? Uh, this is uh, one of the unique plows. We didn't. Uh, we had that in our museum down at Roseville before we moved up here to Monmouth, and we really didn't have much information about except what farm it came from here mm -hmm. locally. Uh, Cleo Dye, who put this room together, most of it together here, uh, he took a picture of it and was at most of his antique gatherings and stuff like that. He yeah. passed that photo around. And uh, someone recognized it, and they found the uh, advertising for it, and so they knew the name uh, Runks 
gang plow, and it gang was managed. Plow. Yeah, uh, because you have two plows, so there's more than one. Oh, mixing okay. Gang. So up to this point, most of them were just a single plow. Single plow. Ah, okay. And, and of course, the, uh, instead of a walk behind plow, the man sat in the in the seat there. And it was manufactured down by St. Louis, but this particular plow was used up here in Warren County. I see. Okay. Well, so so the, the, this guy got a break because he got to sit down, number one. He got one, to sit on. And he got to plow twice as much, number yeah. two, as he would have before. Yeah. Good for him. But he still had to be pretty strong to move all the levers and everything. So I'll bet. No hydraulics there yet. This and, wagon is a Monmouth wagon. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's a Monarch Brown brand wagon. It was sold by the Brownland Scott Company here in Monmouth. Mm -hmm. The Brownland Scott, Scott Company was a uh, uh, general store type, uh, kind of like a Sears or whatever. Uh -huh. You could buy household equipment, uh, farm equipment, and uh, just about anything yeah. you would need. This is a terrific collection. Yes, we're we're you should very lucky to have it. a lot of this. Um, now this is this is also called the the Monmouth. This is from the Monmouth Plow Factory, right? Yes, the Monmouth Plow Factory. Monmouth had a couple, well, three three plow, plow factories in town at one time. There was the Monmouth Plow Company, uh, the Patty Plow Company, and the Weir Plow Company. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, uh, this is just a regular plow, similar to the Runk Plow there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pat single plow. Yeah, single plow. Mm -hmm single bottom here. And then uh, the uh, Pat T. Plow Company, which is basically a cultivator, uh, it was used um, on the check row or the kind of like with the brown corn planter. Uh, they were able to uh, make the adjustments through the row. They'd cultivate it both ways with the row and across the row mm -hmm. so they could make the adjustments for uh, human air and lining up the corn. Uh -huh. And both manufactured here in Monmouth. Both manufactured here uh -huh. in Monmouth. Now this is a, you know, a lot of these hay forks and stuff, a, 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 lot of, a lot of thought was put into how do you get the hay out of the wagon and up into the barn, up right? Up into the barn. Because it's yep. a pretty good throw. It, I mean, you don't want to have to throw it all yeah, up there, right? Yeah, Bef yeah. there's always find a way, better way, better mouse trap yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So they use, they use the, the trolley system here. And this is one of a unique one here. Uh, they uh, tripped this lock mechanism here, and then were able to shove the the screw into the hay, mm -hmm. and then it would lock, and then the then that would pull it up into the barn, and then wherever they're re ready to release it, it would yeah. release it, and then it would just spin off. So if you can pull so a the cork of out hay, of a bottle, you should be able to pull hay out of a, a, yeah. of a wagon. Huh? The weight of the hay would then release it off the uh -huh. fork. And we have several examples. You have the the uh, basket fork here. And yeah, a lot of people preferred to go this way. Yeah, and you had the harpoon forks, a uh -huh. single harpoon or a double <laughs> harpoon. There was as many ideas as yeah. there were. Well, they all worked to, to an extent, didn't they? Yep, yep. And here's an interesting one down here. They call this the grasshopper catcher. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was manufactured here uh, from the Maple City Furnace Company. And it was in Monmouth, all yeah, right? Yeah, that okay. was in Monmouth. Mm -hmm. uh, Monmouth was also known as the Maple City. So a lot of a lot of the manufacturing uh -huh. used that um, moniker, uh, but this was uh, they used this to this was attached to a tractor. This was before insecticides. Now they either fill the trough with water if they wanted to. Eat. Well, let, let me back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Grasshoppers have always been. Some years they're very bad, and some years they're not so bad. But they've always been the enemy of the farmer because they like what's in the field. Don't yes, they? that's right. And if you can get rid of them. Yep. And you don't have insecticide, you get do anything you can, right? Yep. yep. So th they would drag this or push this, this by the tractor? This would be uh, mounted to the front of their tractor. Front of the tractor. Drive, drive it through, and it would be low to the ground, and the grasshoppers would jump up, and then... they jump right into here, and if right you got water it, in it, they're, they're probably swimming around, but they can't get out. Correct, and, and they you, would use it, then be able to use it to feed chickens or hogs. Use the insects to feed the animals, or if you want to kill them, you put kerosene in kerosene there? Kerosene in it. Okay, too. and then they just... Yes. Okay, yep. good. But they can't get out. That's correct. Okay, so that's if you're if you're blighted with grasshoppers, that's one way to cure the cure yep. the problem. And if uh, you like to go fishing, uh, the grasshoppers are a good bait for that yeah. too. <laughs> they sure are. Okay, corn, corn, and more corn. Look at all this. We got and we've got every way there is to pick it too. Yeah. And, and and they've been doing this for generations. Luckily, they don't have to do that anymore. But that's, a lot of people choose to do it by hand. Yep. Because it's they, a competitive thing. Isn't yeah, it? it's still a competitive thing. And. Uh, Way back, um, I think early 30s, they came up with the National Corn Contest, or it was mm -hmm. the State Corn con Contest, but it was so popular, 
there were uh, a national corn contest, and there were thousands of people that would You know, show up. several years ago, we did a story in Roseville because they had the national corn picking competition there, and there weren't this many people there. No, no. <laughs> it was a big deal, but th back in the 30s, this is how big a deal it yeah, was. Yeah, it was a big deal. Big wow. Deal. And uh, they ran that for several years, and I think uh, 1940 was the last year, and then World War II uh -huh. hit. Yeah. So it then yeah. it was kind of... Wow. But, but uh, just like the hay forks there, everybody that had an idea, there was either the hooks or the pegs that they'd use. Every, every farmer probably idea. built his own. His own. He, he had leather and he had some metal. He'd build yeah. his own corn, his own nut. Uh, yep. Yeah. There, is, or, there are thousands of different, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. different patents on that. Wow. This is a terrific exhibit. Yep. Carol Parrish, let's go through the old screen door to Grandma's house. Well, huh? I'd love to invite you into <laughs> Grandmother's house. This is house. Grandma's house. Everybody had at least one grandma, most of the time two, and Grandma had very specific sort of uh, products and ways of doing things. And Grandma never threw anything away. That's so true. you also saw multi-generational things because it could have been from her parents or even grandparents. Mm -hmm. And what this room is set up for is the 30s, 40s, and 50s. There was a big change, uh, the war years and all that. So we're going to see a progression mm -hmm. during those years where work was so hard and then work got easier. A little bit easier. Mm -hmm. But every day there was something to do. It was either wash day or iron day That's or right. mending day. That's how this is set up so mm -hmm. that we could go around the room and make sure that we don't <laughs> miss anything. And another point on this room, Mark, is that there's not a lot of interpretation except for period advertisements. Mm -hmm. Because almost everybody remembers something about this at their grandmother's house. Mm -hmm. Either they lived it Yep. Or, you know, if, if you're in your 50s or older, everybody has a story. That's right. That's right. And let's just walk this way. Okay. Because we've seen, we've seen laundry day there. Because that would have been, I think, on Monday on was Monday. a wash day. Mm -hmm. And, of course, men day. And yes. uh, I imagine there's some kids that come in here have never seen a sewing machine. They before. haven't. And you know what? We have some hands-on projects for kids to do, all the way from doing pot holders to even trying to show them how to sew on a button. Mm -hmm. yeah. And speaking of sewing, you got some master sewers here, too, because many of you work on these quilts, don't you? We do. We have some women that are coming in, but we also <laughs> had a sewing group in town that put this quilt top together. They don't quilt themselves, and so this is going to be a community quilt, and it's going to be raffled off, and the proceeds will go to the museum. Mm -hmm. So very thoughtful. Yeah. yeah, before electrification, and and a lot of people remember those days. This this looks like a commercial ice box, but your regular old home had an ice box too. It and did. A big old block of ice would go in here, wouldn't it? It did. And people would put signs in the front of their houses, I guess, for the amount, the size of ice that they needed, mm -hmm. is what I was told by my grandmother. And this one in particular, though, was um, the patent is from Warren County. Uh -huh. Now it says Monmouth, Illinois, but actually the individual that built these was in the southern part of the county. And there's style C, so you know there was at least a style A and a uh -huh. B. And of course things got, like I said, got easier. Here you've got your motor on the top. We do, and as I told you earlier, this took four individuals to move it. Oh my goodness. And for the weight on this, you didn't really have a lot of room. That's right. That's right. They, they learned a lot in uh, new, new uh, products and techniques in the coming years. Um, oh, and back in the kitchen, of course. In the kitchen. I've had people who have come in here and there has been all sorts of different configurations. You know, some have the water box to it. Mm -hmm. uh, some do not have the... Um, uh, is that the pie holder? Or what is that about? That was uh, well, the warming shelf. Warming the shelf. The warming okay. shelf. Yeah. But, you know, you had to learn... There's no... There is a little bit of a temperature, but you still learn to gauge your fire by your hand. Mm -hmm. And of course, you always had that pot of water, and there are lots of danger around this um, well, piece of equipment. Well, live fire and boils over and all exactly. that kind of stuff. So, and you can just imagine when a woman got an elect or a gas a stove. A gas stove, yeah. She probably, well, I do know that when elect rural electrification came, that men and women literally cried when electricity mm -hmm. came to the farm. You can just envision the amount oh. of time and ease that it helped. Mm -hmm. But all these things are such that people can touch them and look at them, and that's the whole point of this room. Mm -hmm. And as things got easier, the family would get a little more time. And in the evening, 
My goodness, they could even watch TV. <laughs> they could. And this is uh, the first TV that was in Roseville. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, probably the 50s mm -hmm. is what we're thinking. But whenever you look at the big screen TVs today, whenever you know young adults or whatever yeah. come in here and see this tiny little screen, you yeah. can understand why a whole family would move up close to and, watch and, and it. And not too many years before that, they were all huddled around the radio. Exactly. And I have never seen a console radio like this. This has bands from all over the world on it. And most of these stations, except for one, are still in existence today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is amazing to me because I can't say I can listen to Siberia now. <laughs> no. Or Paris. Or how would you even know that? No, exactly. But isn't that fascinating? From mm -hmm. all over the world, shortwave radio. Pretty proud of this piece. Thank you, Carol. Well, thank you for coming and visiting. Jim D. Young, every, every uh, museum has to have somebody that's in charge of the collections. And a lot of people go through a museum and they think, well, that's what the museum has. But in most cases, the museum has all this and a lot more, don't they? <laughs> and a lot more. And yeah. this is a perfect example of what, uh, in, in my former life, uh, was the backstage. Uh -huh. uh, the scene design is downstairs. Up here you were, is where you were a theater professor. I was a theater uh, historian and director yeah. at Monmouth College. Yeah. So, uh, so now you're back. You're, you got the I'm backstage back, I'm now. I'm still backstage <laughs> after 45 years and enjoying every minute of it because, for many historians, the real action is backstage, mm -hmm. where you get this kind of material mm -hmm. and then you get a chance to study it and to try to figure out what it is and where it did come from. And it's a, it's a marvelous challenge and uh, it's exciting. Well, uh, you have, you know, you have new stuff coming in all the time because people donate, but then you also have the original collection, which, all, which has to be cared for. Yes. I mean, it's not, it doesn't just uh, exist on its own. It has to be cared Preservation for. Preservation and conservation uh, is, uh, is job one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a bunch of extremely valuable old quilts that we have stored on racks over in the other part of the back end where it's mm -hmm. very dark because they cannot be exposed to light mm -hmm. but uh, that's one of our jobs is to keep that material safe for the next generation and the generation yeah. after that. Yeah. Uh, well thank you for bringing us up here. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate it. your yeah. coming up here. Yeah. Usually people look at the displays <laughs> and that's not right. at uh, where they're put together and where they yeah. come from. Well so. thank you for what you're doing and Jim is, is a part of a really dedicated group of volunteers that keep this Warren County Historical Museum going. It's open the first Sunday of every month, or if you contact them in advance, you and your group can get a special showing. With another Illinois Story in Monmouth, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.